Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today we're jumping into some malicious compliance. Before we start, if you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button. It's completely free and you can always change your mind later. All right, our first story today comes to us from Proud Reading 3316, Malicious Compliance Immigration Law Edition. Let's jump right in. This is a tale of how I maliciously complied my client into a much better visa route after the Home Office refused her first application. I'm an immigration lawyer in the UK, and if you don't know anything about our immigration system, it's just a mess. The rules are tough, often cruel, very complex, and there's very little flexibility. It doesn't matter how sympathetic someone's circumstances are, if you don't meet all the rules, you're not coming in, even if it's to join your family. Even if you're an elderly person who just wants to spend their final years with their British children. Especially if you're an elderly person who just wants to spend their final years with their British children. Enter Doris, not her real name. Doris is a 93-year-old Australian citizen who lives alone in a nursing home. All her children are in the UK. Doris had a modest wish to move in with her daughters in the UK and spend her twilight years with her family. She was in pretty good health, but her continuing isolation led to anxiety and depression, especially after she was the victim of a robbery. So Doris did what she thought was the right way of going about it. She applied to move to the UK as an adult dependent relative. What she did not know was that this route had almost impossible requirements, so tough that only about 5% of these applications are actually granted outright, and a further 5% succeed on appeal. So the odds are pretty terrible, and you don't get the £3,250 application fee that you paid back if it's refused. Alongside financial and relationship requirements, she had to show that she required continuous care with everyday tasks, like dressing and cooking for herself, and that this care is not available in Australia. She could meet neither of these rules and her application was refused. The refusal letter made a point of emphasizing her excellent health, important for later, as evidenced by the letter she included from her doctor, completely ignoring the parts about her anxiety and depression. This is when she approached my firm for help. Now, appealing this decision would have been a waste of time. She clearly didn't need constant care with everyday tasks, and any care that she might have needed could be found in Australia. But after speaking with Doris, we realized something. Not only was she a Commonwealth citizen as a citizen of Australia, but both her grandparents were born in the UK. So we hatched a plan. The plan. What Doris didn't know is there was another visa she might be eligible for, UK Ancestry. To meet the requirements, she has to be a Commonwealth citizen and have at least one grandparent born in the UK. Done and done. However, this was technically a work visa, so she had to intend to work in the UK and she was very much retired. The thing about the UK Ancestry route is that the Commonwealth citizenship, UK-born grandparents requirements, mean that, overwhelmingly, the people who qualify for this route are white. And because our immigration system is somewhat racist, that means that many aspects of this visa are very generous or even lax compared to other routes. You get a five-year visa straight away instead of having a two-and-a-half-year one that has to be renewed at extortionate prices before you can qualify for permanent residence. Even the application fee is lower than the other categories. Crucially, when it comes to the work aspect, you don't need to be sponsored by an employer, you don't need to work a certain number of hours, the work can be on and off and even volunteering counts as work. This will be important later. The Malicious Compliance You say Doris is in such great health that she doesn't qualify for adult dependent relative visa? Okay, cool, she'll apply for a work visa then. Since the work could be volunteering, she reached out to a community centre in the UK and offered to volunteer at a lunch service they provided for the elderly. The centre was thrilled to have a new volunteer and wrote her a letter confirming this. After preparing all of the other documents, including some going as far back as the 19th century, like her grandparents' birth certificates, we were almost ready to go. All that remained was our covering letter. After outlining how she met all of the requirements, 
I couldn't resist quoting from her previous refusal letter about her excellent health and explaining that given that, Doris would now be working in the UK. I also provided details of the few hours a week she would be volunteering at the community centre and reminded them that their own guidance says they cannot discriminate by age. Her visa was granted and she has now joined her family in the UK as she wanted all along and all she has to do to apply for permanent residence in five years' time is volunteer for a few hours a week. It's worth pointing out that the reason the adult dependent relative rules are so stringent is because in 2012, the Home Office decided that it's costing the country too much to allow elderly parents to settle here as they were considered a drain on the NHS, our universal healthcare system that is free at the point of use. So the rules were changed to make it almost impossible for them to move to the UK. This is despite the fact that prior to the rule change, only about 2,000 people used this route to move to the UK. But there was nothing they could do to stop this 93-year-old in excellent health from joining her family here on this work visa. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Dragon Rose. It says, Likely the volunteer work will help with her anxiety and depression as well, because it will get her out and about and encourage socialization. OP replied to this comment and said, excellent point. I'm sure that being with her family, plus going out to interact with the community, will do wonders for her mental health. I think there's a bigger lesson to be learned from this story, and that's that maybe when going to another country, trying to do all the paperwork and get in yourself isn't the best idea. Immigration lawyers are there for a reason, and if you get one like OP who seems to really know their stuff, then you have a bit of a hand up in the process. I'm really glad to hear that Doris was able to live out her golden years with her family because that's the way it should be. This next story comes to us from Ancient Educator 76. Hey, you can't just sit there like that. Let's jump right in. Let this be the honest entry in whatever malicious compliance chronicles I have. I'm getting an oil change on my passion red Kia K5 right now. I'm weird and quirky, but I keep to myself in situations like this. I don't strike up conversations, nor do I make any kind of contact with anyone for fear that they may interpret this as an invitation to speak to me. I'm really not an arsehole. I get anxiety talking to actual people. Here's an example of what literally happened just before I got my oil changed while getting gas. Just earlier, I saw a license plate that said DAG with other letters, so I said, oh, DAG, without realizing it. The lady getting gas said, oh, my grandma's car, she just passed away. I guess she thought I was calling her out for the handicap plate when she clearly wasn't. I could have said, my condolences, I'm so sorry, I miss my grandma so much. Nope, I go with dead? That's the worst kind of handicapped. This is why I don't talk to people. So I guess while waiting at the oil change place, I was making a stupid face or looked dead, but I was staring hard at absolutely nothing, praying the lady who walked in wouldn't engage. I prayed to the quail and her family running across the gravel outside this oil change facility, people zoo, glass menagerie of hot mechanics and awkward people. She said her stupid stuff about oil change, blah, blah, filter, blah, but all of a sudden I could feel her stare like she was trying to see if I was a statue, inching closer with each passing second. This is where my quirks come in, because I then tried harder to stay still. I guess I moved an iota because she jumped back and said, Jesus H, you can't just fork and sit there like that. She wasn't trying to be funny. She didn't look like a funny person. She looked like she was born mad at the people who made her. She then kept going on about my demeanor, how normal people say hi or at least look, and all I could do was think of some nice, malicious compliance. I straightened up, which I, like John Mulaney, hate more than Isis, posed looking off in the middle distance, finger up in the air a la Bruno saying, I now going to zit like this, knowing that if I committed for the entirety of my time there, I'd make a livid woman that much more so. She replied, you ain't funny butthole, and then took a seat. Three solid minutes pass when I see in my increasingly fading peripheral that she has been staring intermittently, to the point of finally getting up in a major huff, leaving the room to go outside, saying, F this mess. They called my name 10 seconds later. Most agonizing 10 seconds since boot camp. Well worth it though. I really don't think I'm funny. I really do know I'm an arsehole. 
Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called ShadowFactsSTF. It says, A. Sometimes people just don't get that there's all kinds of people in the world. Normal is just a setting on a washing machine. She could have accepted it and walked away. Instead, she decided to get confrontational and tried dragging you down to her level of normal. Not your fault she's threatened by anything outside of her little world. I completely have to agree with this that normal is not a thing. There's definitely an average, but there is no normal. Humans are weird, effed up creatures, each in their own special way. Our next story today comes to us from Logic Girl 1. Can't do anything without a medical reason. Let's jump right in. A few years ago, I worked under a terrible boss whom I shall call Tiff because of all her tiffs. Unfortunately, I am not exaggerating when I say terrible. She had HIPAA violations on record, writing people up for stuff that she told them to do, writing them up for things that happened when they weren't there, changing people's schedules with no notice, and then getting them in trouble when they didn't show up for the change schedule, trying to write people up for using FMLA, the general yelling and petty bullying bad managers do, the works. Senior management knew about all of this and aided and abetted her. Anyways, after being hauled into a meeting with her and a senior manager where she lied about me and did her best to paint me as lazy and a generally terrible worker, I'd had enough. I went to the other senior manager, who shall be called spineless for reasons you can probably guess, and told him that I couldn't deal with this anymore and I had to be transferred to another department in the store. I had experience in a few other areas which were in high demand, so it wouldn't be hard to find a place for me. It would just be hard to fill my spot in the bakery, especially given it was late in the year and we were always incredibly busy over the holidays. Spineless said no. Well, actually he said that he'd see what he could do, but it wasn't likely to happen, because I was too important to the bakery to lose. I pointed out that it was so stressful that it was affecting my health and I really couldn't continue. If I had to, I was going to be calling out. He still said no, we can't do anything unless you have a medical condition. Now, see, I knew what he actually meant was that there was no way in hell they were actually doing anything, so I should just shut up already. Unfortunately for him, I don't like subtexts like that, and I didn't feel like dealing with the mistreatment anymore. So I sat there for a moment debating, and decided to give him what he said he needed. See, I have a few medical issues that are annoying, but unless they actually keep me from doing my work, I think it's kind of a cop-out to bring them up. But under the circumstances, management was being completely unreasonable, so cop-outs it was. So I explained that I had an official diagnosis of anxiety, and due to reasons above, I couldn't work under her. Spineless kind of stopped and looked at me, then said, Uh, okay, well, see what we can do, but we need you to at least get through the holidays. I told him I would do my best, but I couldn't handle the constant threat of write-ups, so he would have to keep her from enacting any disciplinary measures against me. He said, sure. I also added that I really, really didn't want anyone else knowing about my anxiety, as I don't like my personal life being spread about. About a month later, something else happens where a bunch of cakes were ruined and I was the last one who touched it. They were someone else's responsibility as soon as I was done with them. The other person just hadn't done their part, and Tiff was trying to get me in trouble however she could. Tiff hands me a write-up to sign. I'm furious, but I carefully write down in the comment section that I have a medical condition interfering with my work, which I had already notified senior management of. Then, I insist on having her give me a photocopy of it, which they're supposed to do, but often don't. I heard from the supervisor who was also present that when she saw what I had written, Tiff had an appropriately shocked Pikachu face and asked if supervisor had known anything about my mysterious medical issue. For once, Spineless had followed directions and not shared private information with the world. I probably should have just escalated to corporate at this point, but I ended up not just wrote a nicely worded letter about how I had requested ADA accommodations. Because anxiety technically can count as a disability, I had already looked it up. And they had done nothing. Stuck copies of the letter along with the write-up and a note from my doctor in Spineless's mailbox and in the store manager's mailbox. I should probably point out that by this point about four other people had left the bakery due to medical conditions 
which were directly related to Tiff. They were legit medical conditions, but either exacerbated by her or used as an excuse to get away from her. So I certainly wasn't the first person to do this. Lo and behold, when you stuff enough legal terms along with relevant meeting recaps and dates into a letter, people do something about it. I had meetings with both the store manager, who insisted he had heard nothing about this, and Spineless, and they offered to get me out immediately, but asked if there was any possible way for me to stay through Christmas, which was about two weeks away. I didn't really want to be working a different area when everyone else was already crazy busy with no time to catch me up, so I agreed under the condition that they changed my schedule so that I was not scheduled with Tiff at any point in time. And what do you know, they got me out right after Christmas. So yeah, ask and you shall receive, jerks. Hilariously enough, come February, Tiff went on vacation and the bakery supervisor asked me if there was any way I could come back to help cover, which of course I could do. Figured I might as well stick it in their face that the manager was the problem, not the department. Sadly, they didn't do anything about her until she transferred to a different store where she is no doubt still wreaking havoc, but I escaped with my sanity mostly intact, so it was a win for me. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Starfleet Auxiliary. It says, I still hate that managers refuse to make simple solutions to simple problems. Everyone that works with a TIFF knows TIFF is the problem. It's classic. And yet for some reason, everyone in Manglement will refuse to acknowledge this and do the simple thing and fire that person. While I somewhat agree with this comment, unfortunately a lot of the times when there's somebody in a supervisor position who does an absolutely horrible job, but they're allowed to stay on and keep doing that horrible job, it usually means they're either related to somebody or their boots spend many nights underneath the manager's bed. We obviously don't know which one it is in this situation, but I do have to say, I'm very glad OP was able to get out of that department and work somewhere else where they wouldn't have as much anxiety. Our last story today comes to us from Mama Bucket 123 Want me to work while my kid is sick? Okay, let's jump right in. So this story happened not too long ago. I work at a nursing home as a CNA. I have two children, a 17-year-old and a 3-year-old. Sometimes when my kids get sick, I have to go pick them up or not go into work that day. Lately, my little one has been getting sick easily, which the school won't take her if she's vomiting or has a temperature, especially since we just recently got out of the pandemic. But anyway, my job has a new director. He's trying to get everybody on the same page of coming in on time and really punishing the ones that call out often. Now, I don't call out a lot, but my kids do come first and I don't have anyone else to watch my little one. Her father works during the day at the same time when I do, and my parents have cancer right now, so there's no way they could watch her if she's sick. So, my daughter gets sick again with 101 temperature and vomiting. I call out within the time that is allowed, which is two hours prior to my shift. I get a call back from my director saying that's unacceptable, and that I have to be in at work. If I don't, I will get written up. He told me that I should take it seriously because after a write-up, it's suspension and then being fired. So, you want me to come into work? Okay. Cue malicious compliance. Sadly, I packed my sick little girl in the car with a lunch bag and activities, as well as her pack and play toys. Also, a diaper bag. You can guess where this is going. I walked into work with my daughter and bags in tow. I walked into my supervisor's office and I told him her daily routine when she eats, what the password is on her tablet, also when she takes a nap. He looks at me confused. He says, wait a minute, what are you doing? I can't watch her. I tell him, well, I can't either. I have to be on the floor doing my job that you refuse to let me call out of today. So you will be watching my daughter. By the way, she's been vomiting every couple hours, so make sure she stays hydrated. Just then, my daughter throws up on the floor. Not a lot, but enough to show that she obviously was sick. She starts to cry. He tells me that he's sorry and he made a mistake and I am okay to leave. After this, I left and took her to the doctor to get her looked over. She's fine, she just had a bad cold which is making her vomit. I figured if he fired me, I would just collect unemployment temporarily and possibly talk to a lawyer about being fired wrongfully. But hopefully after this situation, he will put thought into a mother calling off for her sick child. 
Jumping down to the comments for this one, there's one down here that's just so perfect we had to put it in. It's from a user called Germond. It says, he will definitely think twice, vomit on the floor will do that. <laughs> OP replied with, it was so perfect too, I almost broke out laughing. Another user down below called Fats Gen Fats said, well done, I hope you didn't clean the vomit. And OP replied, it was mostly bile and juice, he can keep it as a souvenir. Yep, there's really nothing I can say that wraps it up better than that. So check out all four OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.